Yeah, great question. Thank you. Oh, Jeannie, my stomach is growling and you're probably going to pick it up. <laughs> Good, I'm glad your mic isn't picking it up. Hello. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, Hi, Ellie. So oh, my question is, politeness is wielded as a tool of white supremacy culture in like two very different ways. In Marla's case, it's kind of used like for control. And um, in Can I Help You's case, it kind of gives her a sense of work so like was that intentional and like can you talk about that a little bit do you mean you said politeness right i'm just making yeah. sure yeah um ah you guys have great questions um politeness well i mean can i help you is a fantastic rep like that's a metaphor right there for politeness right and her mother is I, I her mother has the bell which i actually have downstairs i did not smash it with a hammer yet i've yet to do it i, I covid came and for some reason the bell lived um but um, not to say that it was, again, I had anti-racist parents. It was, that came from a grandmother who wasn't so anti-racist. Um, but um, politeness is used um, constantly, actually. It's one of the reasons, well, polite, polite conversation. Let's go into that. Let's go into that term, right? What is polite? Um, yes, Jeannie asked me, and the, yes, the, ba the bell is real. It's downstairs. Um, it's very small and very touristy. It's ridiculous. Um, Anyway, polite conversation. Let's think of that. Polite conversation, well, we just talked about trauma. Can't talk about that in polite conversation. Uh, racism, can't talk about sexism. Can't talk about that. I actually mentioned the other day that I was had had a man published uh, switch or any of my surrealist titles that they would be lauded for. And I don't, I'm not saying I'm not lauded. I'm not here to like, I don't care. I don't mind. I like writing the books I write. I'm very happy with my life. I'm just saying that the business and the culture would elevate a, a, a male writer for writing what I write. And they wouldn't would kind of bench him uh, as far as they concerned. They, they think YA is a, a bench. I think it's actually a, a, a hot air balloon that takes me higher and higher. But most of the things I talk about, period, are not polite conversation. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that keeps everybody down, but keeps white people in a place of privilege, keeps men in a place of privilege, absolutely. Um, but politeness on a whole is the reason we don't talk about things. And I honestly, to me, that is the most bizarre idea that I can't even argue against it. It's just sort of like looking at somebody going, what are you talking about? Like, I kind of just have this horrible look on my face. Like, what? Like, ew, like, who would, how are you interesting? What do you talk about then? Just the nice, you know, country music or something. And, uh, you know, I don't know what people talk about if they don't talk about problems. If we're not talking about our problems, I don't know, but you're right. And that's not considered polite. And so um, that's how we wield it, I guess. I mean, we wield it by saying, well, it's not polite to talk about race. It's not polite. And I mean, that's been said many a time. Oh, you can't talk about race because we're all white people. So we can't talk about race. Actually, we can very much talk about race. Um, all white people we can talk about whiteness, um, which is our race. If we have to check a box, there's the box. It says it, you know. Um, I like how a lot of times it says Caucasian. I'm like, that's not actually what that word means, by the way. <laughs> There's a place in Asia uh, that those people come from, and uh, those are Caucasian people. We are white. Let's just call it what it is. But we don't like that. We politely call it something else. How weird. So we already know there's a problem with it. That's why we put Caucasian on the thing. But we don't want to talk about the problem with the word white because we're white. It's so weird. It's just to me like that, that is like, I love your question, but at the same time, it, the idea of it, right. The concept of it is just so bizarre and not bizarre. There's a better word for it. Um, farcical. And the idea is so farcical that I want to leave it over there where it belongs. Yeah. Kind of in a way. I, and I don't know what to say about it. Cause I just don't live that life. I've never have. It's one of the reasons why I have the friends I have and the people surrounding me are the people surrounding me. You know what I'm saying? By this age, the people know what they're dealing with. I'm a real in Jamaica, they call it real, 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 not just real. I'm real, real. And it's true. And, uh, but I don't like, hopefully I don't bring like downer conversations to Thanksgiving either. I don't know. I also can have fun, I don't know. but it's real fun because I've already dealt with the trauma. See, it's not fake fun. That's the reason we do this, right? <laughs> Thank so, you. So, so what about, can I help you? <laughs> Elijah's like, oh, I got another, I got an idea. I'm running. Do it, do it. Well, there's this contrast. I don't know if Elijah's going to mention this between um, not politeness is not talking about something and gimme. 
that was exactly what I was going to ask about. Ask. So, I mean, yeah, so, so there is this contrast between the politeness of, uh, of Marla, which is, which is, I mean, it's, 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 certain, it's exactly what you talked about, but, but there's also this whole thing with, with can I help you, like wanting people to say please, and, and talk about this whole thing with gimme gimme, and, and also that whole code word with please to buy uh, weed. Yep. Um, and so, so, so just, just how, how, how does that factor in? Because I mean, I, I'd call that like I, I I think I'd use the same word, but I think they are two different, two entirely different things. So it may not make sense to use the same word for them. But how how does that factor in with this? No, yeah, I think I think you've nailed it. I mean, can I help you? I mean, don't forget, she is she is uh, not very. She doesn't like those gimme people. Well, I mean, look, that's privilege, right? And it's so funny because we're all taught, oh, say please and thank you. But then we get to the drive through and I know this because I listen and I, I used to run a drive through at Arby's, but I didn't sell weed through the window because <laughs> that's that's the fun part of writing fiction. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't think of that then. Um, but anyway, just kidding. Um, we are gimme, gimme, gimme people. We are. I had, a, I had a person, you know, I had a guy step right in front of me recently and I had a guy decide that he was going to get in the car wash line in front of me, just like, just to do it. And then he sat there and he didn't move forward and go into the, he didn't even know I was there. He didn't know I was there. And so I think that, I mean, gimme is, I mean, that's privilege. That's, that's privilege right there, you know? Um, and, um, and yet politeness, it's funny because we, we demand, we live a double standard, all of us for the most part. Okay. And that's one of the things that drives me a little bit bonkers about um, a lot of things. I mean, I can, I can do it and I can, I can go off on it when it comes to um, uh, my relationships with men, we'll say, or why am I making it sound like there was more than one? There wasn't, I was married a very long time, but um <laughs> You know, I was married a very long time, but in that relationship, you know, you look at that sort of privilege and, and what people expect, the expectations um, and the expectation in my, in my life was that I wasn't going to talk about the truth, which makes no sense. Like, um, because if you know me, you know, I'm going to talk about the truth and that would, but I, it was, it's always framed as that's politeness, you know, it's polite. And, and, and you've hurt me if, if, if you're talking about the truth. And I'm like, that's weird. Cause you're hurting me if you're not talking about the truth. So there's, I feel like almost there's two different types. It's a little bit star Wars, right? It's a little bit black and white of me to say this, but that there is like, there are the people who are willing to talk about the stuff that's happening. There's people who aren't. Um, and what we do though, to shame the people who are willing to talk about what's really happening is we say that's impolite. Um, as for the gimme people, they're the first people to complain when somebody doesn't say please or thank you. They didn't send me a thank you note for the gift I gave them. Really, are you literally saying gimme to a child because you sent them a gift? In my world, a gift is something given. You don't give gifts to get thank you notes. If you give gifts to give thank you notes, you're bonkers and you're overdoing it. Um, you're, you know, there's no reason. Like, I'm sorry, there's times to send, send thank you notes. Absolutely. I will send you a thank you note and at the bottom of my heart, when I want to thank you, if you don't give a gift because you're giving it, what are you doing? You're manipulating, right? And that's exactly how politeness is used, right? It's manipulating all the time. It's constant manipulating. We are manipulated so much by every corporation, every politician, sometimes every family member, every person we meet. Manipulation is kind of the backbone of our language, right? When we speak, how we speak, how we do things, because why? Because we want to get things, because technically it's gimme. Underneath all that is gimme. And it's interesting because the same person that uses that manipulation will turn around to you and say, you know, you really should be more polite. Or are you going to mow your grass? Or, or you know, you're, you're, there's a few leaves in your flower bed. I live in a town now. It's so weird. People are so weird. I used to live on a farm. No one cared about my leaves before. People care about my leaves now. I'm like, you know, and, I'm, and I, I do them once a week, like when the truck comes and sucks them up, which right there, also hilarious to a farm girl. Like a truck comes and sucks up leaves, mind blown. But I get it. I, and they have to manage their town and it's wonderful. But this is the thing. People think that me sucking up my leaves is polite. But <laughs> talking crap about my back or behind my back, uh, talking crap behind my back about, say, my life, my situation, um, even even as I mean, in, people talk people talk badly about my household because my daughter died. How about that one? We don't talk about death enough in this country. 
so that and people want sympathy when their mom goes or when, when anybody goes. But when I lose my daughter, suddenly it's like, oh, well, that's a sin, first of all. And she, it mustn't have been a very nice home. Like that is the first thing we do in the, and I don't mean to like drop that information on you, but it's just a very interesting way to look at the double standard of politeness because these people want politeness and then they'll treat my family like this. It's so weird. Um, but they don't understand that, that that can happen to them any day either. I know this because I work with people who've lost same as I did. Um, and they don't understand. They think, oh, that can't happen to my family. Oh, oh, that's not true. Um, and that's the problem. Eventually it catches up with us. But I don't know if I just went off on that. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, that's, that's, how they, that's how they work. It is a double standard. It's just a, it's a massive double standard. <sighs> I think I'm actually done. One more, one more question. All right, cool. Because I gotta go. I gotta go to a training session. I'm... <laughs> okay. So, um, so when I was reading it, uh, I was obviously reading it with the book group, but my mom was reading it at the same time as me, and we there's so much to dig into. And even though like she's older, and some people would say wiser, like we still had like the equal amount to talk about. So what would you say to people who mistakenly believe that YA literature is too easy and doesn't maintain rigor to be taught? <laughs> oh boy. Well, I will say that people who say that YA literature is anything haven't already, they already haven't read enough YA literature. I, I teach YA literature um, and I teach literature for young people. And what you'll find if you actually study it is that there is as many different types of literature for children as there are for adults. So if you want to walk into a bookstore and say all books suck, then that's your that's that's you being oversimplified. Um, that's what I would say to that person. You're you know if you're saying all YA literature isn't blah, that would be like saying all. Uh, literature for adults is whatever I guess they put down romance the most right or fantasy or paranormal romance or god knows I don't know whatever whatever they want to put down they'll put it down adults will put down things for teenagers before they'll put down anything else though they will roll their eyes at you faster than anything else they will they will make you small I don't understand it you are only coming into your adulthood and your lives the whole point of our existence as adults is to lift you up not bring you down so the first thing I'd say to anybody saying that is wow, you don't respect teenagers. What a shame for you. Why are you working with them? That's the first thing I would ask them. Why are you working in teenage? For te why are you on a school board? You clearly do not understand teenagers, nor do you care about them. You see, you see them as so small. It's the exact same as if they want to make fun of, I don't know, I'll say Justin Bieber, but that's not what kids listen to anymore. <laughs> but, you know, uh, what, whoever, whoever it is, they'll roll their eyes. And my, my days, it was Culture Club or Prince. Oh, God, you know, like, like none of us understood what Prince was talking about. Every single one of us knew what Prince was talking about. You can put a big sticker on the front of it and say parental warnings. Prince says stuff that you already do whatever anyway um as for <laughs> as for people thinking that books written about young adults aren't shouldn't be in schools being read by young adults especially um i'll, I'll say literary novels I'd say i would consider this a more literary novel um if we wanted to put subcategories uh, the way that we do um in adult work which we should I don't know what to say to them um, with a, you know, you're going to get your Shakespeare. You're going to get to read The Merchant of Venice. You're going to get to read perhaps Mockingbird, perhaps, well, I don't know, whatever classics are in your canon. The idea is, is that teenagers feel seen. The idea of reading a book is to feel seen. The idea of, of reading a book is to open your mind to a new world because you see yourself in it, if that makes sense. Um, and, and also to learn about other people, right? I would, I would hope that people who, who read um, something like Dig might read something that's a little more, certainly more commercial, more popular, but something like The Hate You Give, which was published only, I think, maybe two years before it, um, and allows you to see and feel what it feels like to be a person of color in a community where, you know, where... The world is different, that's for sure, for, for a totally, for, 
for human beings that live in the same place as we do, and we're, not, we're so privileged, we don't see that. So it'd be a great conversation, um, uh, both for adults and teenagers. But I don't know. I mean, the idea that people would think that something like DIG wouldn't be for teenagers makes me understand that, well, I already know this. I hear this a lot. They don't understand teenagers and they don't want to. They don't want to stop and understand the teenagers. You know, the, the idea that people don't, here's one for you. If, I, if someone says the word sex in front of a teenager, everybody freaks out. First of all, without it, those teenagers wouldn't exist. Let's start there. None of us would. It's like periods. People freak out over periods. Why? Without them, none of us would exist. Um, makes no sense. But we freak out over it. And, and not only that, like 51% of, let's not even go there, but they have them, you know, but like this idea that we can't talk about drugs. Oh, don't talk about drugs. Really? We used to have, we used to have commercials with a frying pan and an egg, and this was your brain on drugs. Like, and then, and then I had my kid, we were walking around the other day and he was like, so like, how come you can, you can people can like have a drink, but then they don't become alcoholics. But then people say, don't touch heroin because you're going to get addicted. Like, what's the deal? And like, he didn't know the basics about drugs because we're no longer teaching it in health classes anymore because, oh, we're too polite to do that. Um, which to me goes back to what young adult books are really doing. They're delving into the ideas and the things that, that are, that teenagers need to discuss to have healthy lives. Um, so whether it's something, and a lot of times it's heavy material. Yes, there's death. Yes, there's even like, oh my gosh, suicidal ideation, self-harm, uh, mental illness, but also race, but also love. Also maybe some, some relationship abuse or maybe a really great relationship. Why? Not? That's what books are for, to model really good things for us and to warn us off the bad things and to help us see what's really going on. Why you would want to keep that from teenagers I do not know. That would be someone who, as far as I'm concerned, is anti-intellectual, anti your intellectual freedom as young people, which is why public libraries and libraries and schools and librarians are heroes because they care about your intellectual freedom. Teachers as well, um, for the most part, depends on where you are, I guess, because not all teachers, I guess, uh, would. But um, I would think young adult books are for are for young adults because they're going to see themselves in them. And I think young adults are for adults because they'll see their teenagers in them and they better wake up and understand that the world has changed. Um, and they might better be able to have better conversations with and better relationships with their teenagers, which is incredibly important. And as someone who lost a teenager, who had a really great relationship with my teenager, I, I knew, I knew the situation with my daughter. She struggled a very, very long time. And we talked a lot. Um, and I, I do this work, you know, I've done this work for a long time, long before I lost my daughter. Um, and I would not have been able to have the conversations I had with her had I not had an open mind to the teen experience. The idea that we were all perfect as teens is ridiculous. Um, uh, but the, the fact that we're still trying to snow them into believing it, that's not new at all. They've been doing that for generations. <laughs> so um, what would I say? I would say, oh, grow up. That's what I would say to anybody saying that young adult books shouldn't be read in schools. I'd say grow up. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. You guys, students that just asked me questions. I know people are going and coming, but thank you very much for your questions. Meg, wow. Hey, I'm gonna, I've got tears in my eyes. I'm shaking. I mean, what a champion you are for our young people, Amy. You are a gift to us. You're a gift to librarians where I can give a book to students with my whole being and my whole heart and open a door to the world that you create and honor them through by speak by being real by being fun by being honest and telling them the truth that they're not hearing in other places so thank you so much thank you so much for supporting me it's a huge deal i got a lot of a lot of teachers and a lot of librarians who back off of me and i'm i'm cool with it i get it but we got all your books spread out on the table. We got we got your whole collection here. Maybe we'll we, Elijah and I will design the curriculum that they they, they awesome. AS King. Well, seminar. listen, Meg. Whatever happens when you do anything AS King again, have me in. Just just let's just do this. Let's zoom me in. That's that's what I do. I like to connect, and I'm about to be on the road again and do stuff. I'm gonna start start. I, I think I'm just going to like staple an N95 mask to my face and just start <laughs> traveling again. I miss being with young people and going into schools and, and talking um, and just being able to talk 
openly about stuff and blow their minds uh, in what I call the trauma comedy, <laughs> trauma comedy <laughs> show, <laughs> but they don't know it. And it's not, I, I don't want to ever bum anybody out. You know, I always just want to help. I always just want to help. I really appreciate what you just said because I rereading dig, I laughed so hard and I, yeah. Also, I'm aware that you're writing about trauma and like the capacity to hold both the humor and the trauma in one place is really powerful. Thank you, Amy. All right. See you guys. Thanks for your great questions. Thanks for reading the books. Thanks for being champions. You're amazing.